Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. And this is kind of a special episode because we are going to dual broadcast this on another show as well. My my very good friend Olga Zar is joining me today. So do you want to do a little intro for your show too? Yeah. So uh, hi, I'm Olga Zar. I am Doug's friend. One of the things I did thanks to Doug was to start my own show. So I will be, so I'm very happy that this, um, this video will also be on my show. I am an SEO consultant and today we want to talk about SEO success and kind of define success, SEO success, success from our own perspectives and maybe share some tips or have I spoiled it? <laughs> that is, that's perfect. And it's going to be an interesting conversation. And I think, you know, people that have listened to some of my more recent shows and, and follow what I'm currently working on, I have moved a little bit away from SEO, especially sort of the pure SEO that you're doing and you're consulting on Olga. And I'm focusing more on like general personal branding and other areas aside from just a, a pure content site where I started with like niche sites and stuff. So yeah, we're going to talk about like kind of defining success in general and then focus on SEO. And then we're going to go through like some specific tips that maybe people can apply directly, whether it's directly with SEO or maybe it is more around personal branding. Like I said, my focus has shifted a little bit and I could talk about that some too. Now, for the people that don't know you, Olga, can you give a little bit uh, more of an intro about yourself? Like maybe uh, your background as an SEO consultant and professional? Yeah, sure. So the name of my brand is SEO Sly. This is, this is my website, my channel, my podcast. So I've been in SEO for, I think more than 12 years now. For the past three years, I was doing a little bit of uh, consulting and I was still having a job. For the last year, I have been a full-time independent uh, SEO consultant. Uh, my career has shifted recently, I can say. And having been through different stages of an SEO career, like starting at the, at the SEO agency, being an in-house, being uh, the SEO uh, director at some point, having at some point having two jobs, two full-time jobs, going through all those different stages and also building my brand during that time. I think I gathered a lot of insight into success with what success in SEO means for me and how it evolved. So my specialization within SEO is now SEO auditing. I mostly do client work. But on the side, as my side hustle, I, I share my knowledge about SEO in the form of articles, again, on my YouTube, on my podcast, and so on. I hope that's, that's enough of an intro. That's perfect. And I'll, I'll do a little bit of an intro as well. So I started in 2013, so about 10 years. So I'm a little less experienced. And the funny thing, as I talk to more professional SEOs who either run agencies or are, you know, freelance consultants or even in-house SEOs at, you know, bigger companies, the, the knowledge that I have makes me, uh, you know, aware of SEO. And if I talk to a mainstream audience, if I talk to my parents, friends or, or whatever, like I know about search engines. I'm an expert in that area. But if I'm in a room at a conference where the focus is SEO, then I have very little like real in-depth knowledge. So it's super interesting to learn more and more in the depth that, and detail that people can get into for schema markup and maybe like knowledge panel, uh, you know, strategies. And I just don't know as much. So it's been interesting being around experts, like real super in-depth experts that have, you know, the equivalent of like a PhD in SEO. So my background was mainly with niche sites and it was just on the side. When I got laid off, I grew the 
affiliate marketing business into something bigger and started offering online courses as well. So I had an email list from the beginning and kind of, I, I mean, I really tried to insulate myself from like Google updates, which that's a thing that comes up all the time, especially in you know, 2022 and 2023. There have been so many updates, some really devastating, and there's been a lot of chatter about you know, are these updates even better? Like these results are not that great. And it's kind of, it's very weird to see the shift. And there was that Verge article that came out a few months ago in uh, November, I guess. And, you know, some people were pretty upset. And did, did you read the article, Olga? Maybe, so. maybe not like entirely, but uh, it wasn't really uh, optimistic and positive about SEOs. <laughs> right. Well, you needed to finish the article. So that I interviewed the journalist the other day. So I don't want to go on a huge tangent, but I interviewed oh. the journalist because I was like, this article is great. So if you finished uh -huh. it, she also said, ah, I don't know if Google's doing a great job either. So uh -huh. that was the thing. A lot of people didn't finish the article. So, okay, I'll, I'll bring it back on track. So my, my background really has shifted as, uh, or not my background, but my focus has shifted as I have grown as an entrepreneur and I thought, well, I don't want to go to battle with Google every single update and try to figure out what's going on. So I've started to focus more on creating content around the areas that I'm interested in, which makes it a lot more fulfilling. And me personally, I, I never did um, client work. And as soon as I tested it, I thought, well, I don't, I don't think I want to run an agency or do client work. It's not, I don't have enough control over my time if I'm working with clients. So I, I've shifted uh, far away from that and try to really uh, maximize the control that I have over my time. So, so that's me. Um, I think maybe we can get right into the details of like defining success in SEO. And I'll turn it over to you, Olga, for this. Okay, sure. So initially, when I was starting out, the definition of, of success in SEO for me was, was to become was to learn SEO to actually know how it works, what to do, because like, I was starting with this um, site build it uh, program, I think you remember that when you were, when you were going through a course, and during that course, you were creating a website that was actually earning could earn potentially money for you. So at first it was for me to learn then it was to actually make money with seo because i i don't come from a very rich background so earning like even a bit was was like would 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 be a total total game changer for me this was my my goal my my definition of success earning money from from seo for i think a couple of years when I actually started to earn some money, then it was more about uh, maybe let's um, become, maybe let's let's get a new title, let's become a senior SEO at the agency. Then uh, let, then I, I was able to become a director of SEOs, which which also like sounded great. So those titles sounded sounded great. Then I um, kind of felt that this is not uh, the place I really want to be. Uh, I, I want freedom. I want to be uh, my own boss. Uh, and the success meant for me that I can say uh, that I can give up all the jobs and I, I can walk away from, from jobs, not have a, a jo an SEO job, any job and, uh, ever in my life again, and simply being an SEO consultant. So I was able to realize that last year. It was like total success for me and the way I felt about being free, it changed things completely. But this year, um, like next year, 2024, I think the success will be for me to be able to balance SEO, SEO, I work, client work, all the things I'm doing, my branding with actually life, getting this work life balance because I love SEO so much that I, that I completely, I think, kind of blended my life with SEO and my life became SEO, SEO became my life. And I don't think this is a good place to be for, for too long. So this is my definition of success now, being able to balance what I love, being free, having enough money to live the lifestyle I want, but also like having other things in my life. 
as well. What about you? Very close uh, in the beginning, and it certainly shifted over time. When I first started, my goal was to earn $350 per month with an affiliate site. And maybe it was good timing, maybe it was uh, luck, probably mostly luck, but after discovering the concept of like making money online and SEO in general, I think it was only like five months, four months, something like that. And I hit $350 a month. And like many good SEOs, I had like a, a very uh, fast trajectory, a very steep climb. And within six or seven months, I made like $6,000, which I which was amazing, right? A huge amount of money. And I thought I had everything figured out. It quickly followed with an SEO uh, manual penalty from oh. Google. So there's a lot of stories like that, especially in those days where we were practicing gray hat a little bit more, but you can grow really fast, but if you could grow fast and you could lose it really quickly. So I had a lot of, you know, roller coaster rides along the way, but like you, I was obsessed and I was really into it and, and a lot more in the weeds, writing content, uh, doing keyword research, which is was kind of like my area of focus. So I mentioned earlier that some of the more advanced SEOs that do this full time and are deep in the weeds currently, they are very good with say like on page or some of the more technical aspects. I am very good at keyword research and that's an area that I focused on quite a bit. But over time, I went from, hey, I want to make a couple hundred dollars a month on the side to I would love to replace my full-time job. And my hand was forced when I got laid off. So I thought, oh, now's a great chance to work harder on it. And one thing that I have been proud of is a lot of folks that have a, um, a course business, they often make more money with their course than they do with their affiliate sites or whatever it is they're practicing. And it's often frowned upon in the make money online world because people were like, hey, if, if it was so good, why don't you just stop teaching it and then do more mm -hmm. of the work? So for uh, most of my online career, I've made about the same in, on both sides. Now, as I've exited some sites and, and kind of moved on into other areas, it shifted, of course, when you sell the sites, you get a huge lump sum, but then you move on with your life. And that's what I've been doing. So at this point, like I don't define like SEO success um, monetarily. It's more what you talked about. It's more lifestyle. And like, is this a business that I want to run? Like we're designing our own companies and our own roles. So we could only blame ourselves if we end up doing work we don't want to do or working too much or whatever. And the thing is, like, as you're going through the transition, I found for myself, you say yes to almost all the opportunities that come your way because in the beginning, we didn't have any opportunities. So we needed to say yes to figure out what worked and what we liked. But then what happens? And, and especially after you started your podcast and you're getting more traction, you're speaking at events, I think, and you're writing in different uh, places, like, all the opportunities that come to you are going to be good. Pretty much all of them. So you have to say no to very good opportunities that you would have jumped at before. So you have to only pick the ones that are awesome, the ones that you want to do with people that you want to do with that gives you flexibility. So it's really hard to like switch, but you have to literally just say no to most things that look awesome. You have to say no to things you want to do for things that you want to do more. Yeah, totally, totally. This is like, this is something I have started doing, I think this year, because like, like two years, three years ago, when I started like becoming visible online, yes, I would say yes to everything. But now I just like, I would go crazy. I would have to like hire 100 people, but I, but I don't want to, I don't want to grow into an agency. I want to keep that relatively free uh, lifestyle where I don't have to manage a lot of people. Maybe I will hire a VA and that's all I am planning on doing. So, and regarding the, um, the income, in my case, it was a bit strategic. So I waited until I get around half of my income from uh, my 
my side clients or my side projects and half from the from the employer and and then i kind of said i'm done and this was the best the best decision i i i made at that point so it wasn't that uh, i wasn't like forced in the way you were but maybe maybe if i were forced to do that like five six years earlier i think my traje trajectory would look a bit better but like we cannot change the past so <laughs> right I, honestly i was lucky to get laid off because i had a remote job that paid well with awesome benefits and i was starting i had a lot of autonomy there so i was starting to take my ideas that i wanted to implement and i wouldn't get approval and i would just start doing something with my team like hey let's try something different that i read in the four hour work week and the management didn't like that, that at all and uh that's i think that's why i got laid off i mean i was the first in this the string of layoffs that lasted like a year or something like that but i was one of the better managers so they sh they really shouldn't have laid me off uh -huh. but i was like doing all this all this stuff that they didn't like because i was treating it like an entrepreneur instead of a, mm -hmm. a, man, a middle manager that was like just trying to follow the rules i was like let's try something new i kept doing it over and over again so eventually they were like let's get rid of this guy but well let, let's shift i know um we want to talk about some tips for seo success in 2024 which is it's tough to do uh, there, there are people that make all these predictions um but but we don't know the future one thing I, I didn't tell you I was going to ask this, but I heard um, the question posed. So we have a lot of things we could predict, maybe the changes that are going to come. And that's what we, we usually focus on. What do you think is going to stay the same in 2024 that usually stays oh, the same? That's a good question. I, I think seo uh, i think companies will still need help of of seos even if the form of seo the google changes or how search results are presented changes i think companies will still need our help to figure things out so i don't think seo is going to like in the in the form we know it to, is going to die next year maybe a little bit evolve but still, I think the fundamentals of SEO should still work as they were working, as they have been working for like, I don't know, past 10, 15 years. So that would be my prediction. What about you? I, I agree generally with what you're talking about. And I'll try to be really specific around the content area. So even though I whine and complain just like everyone else that Google gives us these guidelines like, hey, create high quality content and make sure you have some experience and be an authority and write for the visitor, write yeah. for the searcher, all the normal stuff, even though I would get frustrated with that advice, that is solid and I would I would go further, right? So I asked the question, but I'm also going to answer a different one. The thing is, if you take those ideas and just put it into different formats, it will meet the audience where they are. And the thing is, video is hard, right? You started doing your, your videos and channel and tutorials and being on camera is rough. I was uh, complaining earlier, you know, I didn't fix my hair properly this morning. And I was a little nervous to get on camera, right? So it's tough, right? It's hard to get in front of the camera or even just do audio, even if you're doing no video at all. Fairly difficult knowing that people are going to listen to it. And I think if you take your well-written content and repurpose it to different areas, video and audio, that's, that's the move that I think will separate you from your peers and you'll be competing on a completely different level than other people that are not doing those two formats, which are, like I said, it's difficult and you end up getting into like, are you creating a personal brand? Which some people don't wanna do, maybe they think it sounds stupid or something, but what it allows you to do is just whatever you want. Like it, it doesn't matter, like if you're interested in it, you could just move forward with it and you don't have to cater to the 
uh, topical area that Google thinks you're associated with. So you're like, I don't know if I should publish that on my blog. I don't care. I publish whatever I want. And I know, I mean, I'm a decade in, right? So it's easy for me to say. But at some point, I had nothing. I didn't know what I was doing at all. So any thoughts on that? Any thoughts on like... Yeah, I... I think this is a great tip, something I also have been doing for some time. And I think you can also do it in reverse when you have now when you have chat GPT. So what I have also been doing this year is I have a video because I, I don't write transcripts or anything. I don't plan my videos. I always record them on the on the spot. So very often when I recorded a video, I transcribed it and then I put the transcript into chat GPT fed ChatGPT with some SEO rules and asked it to write an article about that. Uh, I've, I looked for some keywords that may potentially, uh, um, this article may, may potentially write for, uh, rank for. I optimized uh, the article and in some cases of those articles with embedded video and embedded po podcast, they do rank. So doing it this, this other way is also is also a, a huge time saver, especially if you are not into writing blog posts. <laughs> and this is how I've been using ChatGPT quite a bit. And you can go, you know, in many different directions. So if you have a blog post that you know is good, or maybe I didn't write it, let's say I find three or four blog posts that are very good on a topic, I'll feed them into ChatGPT and then say, create a podcast outline in a series of questions. And then that's my research, right? I maybe still need to go reference the uh, reference material at the beginning, but mm -hmm. generally I have the outline or I could say, hey, I'm gonna interview Olga and here's the topic, here's some background information, what questions should I ask? And then it makes it super easy, but your idea about um, you know, taking that transcript, creating a blog post, like that's a perfect application. Now, what SEO rules do you use for ChatGPT? What do you tell it? Can you share those? Sure. So basic SEO rules. So I'm telling ChatGPT what keyword or keywords I want to rank for. Then I want the article to have to have a lot of headings, subheadings. I want to have that target keyword in all the headings, subheadings. I always also feed ChatGPT with the entire ar article once it's written, once it's written, and ask it to uh, to write 10, 15 FAQs about that topic. And of course. With FAQs, they are also marked as headings, H3 headings, for example. There, there is this phrase as well. And of course, other on-page SEO things like adding this, this, um, this keyword to title, meta description, to alt text of images. So basically anything I can do in terms of on-page SEO plus internal linking. And um, ChatGPT is pretty okay with doing that. Very Sometimes you, sh you, you have to, uh, you, you want, I don't advise creating the entire article, especially a longer one with one prompt, but you can do a section by section. And this is, this is uh, the quality I think is enough, but of course you have to proofread it. How, I guess I've heard a lot of people say, Hey, I don't want to do the whole article at once. Just do a section. What happens if you try to do the whole article versus just a section at a time? Very often it ends up way shorter than I want. Even if I say, say it to ChatGPT, write that many words and it kind of starts becoming like shorter or m less detailed at the end. I think this is, this is the way this autocomplete mechanism works. It kind of, uh, at the end, it, it becomes a little bit worse. That's why I usually ask ChatGPT to create the outline. And then I take those specific one, two points from the outline and then create with specific prompts, those specific sections. I also tested a lot of like fully automated tools where like you, you create like the entire process, like that, that at the end you are supposed to get like the, I don't know, 3000 words, super detailed, optimized article that automatically uh, is published to WordPress. So I was playing with that stuff as well. But the quality of those articles wasn't there, so they they weren't SEO enough. Maybe it was me. I, I didn't know how to program that tool. I don't remember the name of that tool, 
but going back and forth with chat GPT, doing, do, doing that in sections and adding my own images, like publishing it on my own, maybe refining a little bit. I think this is a good balance between doing a purely AI, AI written article and still like adding things from myself. And I have one website where I only create articles this way, like a test website. And so far it's been like ranking like, like this. Um, so, but it, it looks very authentic because there are images, there is internal linking. There are a lot of, of those things, but that content is like 100% from ChatGPT. but we'll see what happens after a few more updates. <laughs> right. Well, let's, let's move into that a little bit. We have a lot more sophisticated AI tools. People are using AI in better ways, like we just described. And my friend, Tony Meritado, he has figured out a pretty simple way to feed ChatGPT medical uh, journal articles. And then he'll ask ChatGPT to interview him as an expert physical therapist. And uh -huh. then he ends up with a very good article that has like good reference material plus his own experience as an expert. So there's all these great implementations. So wh what do you see Google um, in say six or 12 months dealing with AI content in general, whether it's high quality or low quality AI content? So Google, I think at some point they had in their documentation, something that AI content is, is bad, that content written by AI is not helpful, something like that. Then they removed something. And now it says that they value content written for people, not by people, but for people. So they, they removed all those notions saying that AI content is bad. So I don't think it is good for, for them in, ta in terms of even costs to try to, I don't know, to try to um, find out whether a site uses uh, AI generated content. And I think those AI detectors, no matter how much sophisticated, I, I, I don't think they can be that reliable. And I don't think Google would have time to, uh, would have time and resources to try to figure out whether content is AI written or human written. And I believe they will still focus on the content being free of any mistakes, factual mistakes, having this EEAT element being helpful. I analyzed the documentation about EAT, helpful content, core updates and something else. And I came up with a list of, I think, 90 things more or less tangible that Google values. And uh, within those things, there is also, if you are using AI content, you should probably state that clearly uh, or explain why. So maybe this disclaimer is something that may protect you potentially from like harm from Google sites, but even Google in search results, in featured snippets, it is all AI content, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, they had to say we're okay with this because they were just, <laughs> they were doing the same thing. Yeah. When, when, it, yeah. And I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think Google is struggling because we have laid out a couple use cases of using AI to actually create something probably useful, maybe more useful, right? So I get emails all the time about, hey, I don't want to watch your uh, video. I don't want to watch your uh, long interview. Can you just give me the transcript? I want to read it. And what we're oh. doing, we're saying, hey, I, like we'll give you the transcript. We'll also scrub it, right? Because when we look at this conversation, it's scattered. I go on tangents. Our sentences are fragments usually. And if you have AI clean up a transcript, you end up with a whatever 400 word article that has the bullet points. And that's all you need to know. Like if you're just trying to skim and get the pure information out, AI is a perfect tool to extract that from a rambling transcript. So there's a great use case for that. At the same time, you know, when I look at search results and I've tried to get some information about a supplement the other day, I ended up on Reddit where there were a few people like trying to, uh, they didn't know what they were talking about. And I don't know who they are. They're like some anonymous Reddit user. And mm -hmm. I didn't trust them. I'd rather end up actually on an affiliate site where maybe 
they happen to be an expert, right? Sometimes, especially in the supplement space, it could be kind of weird, but sometimes it's a PhD researcher who has a website and you can see that uh, they have a podcast and they have a YouTube channel and they have other things yeah. that show me that like they know what they're talking about. So I didn't find any useful information on Reddit, even though for a lot of queries, at least right now when we're recording this, Reddit or Quora, it's it's at the top. And I don't want those answers because people are morons, usually. And so. just one question. Did you happen uh, in the past or now uh, to write articles targeting uh, Query Plus, Reddit or Quora? <laughs> no, I never <laughs> I, I never did that, but that, that is kind of funny that, um, I mean, that, that's what happened. That's, I mean, that's the incentive. Did uh, you do that? <laughs> no, I was, I was going to, but I, I gave it up finally because I had like other things to do, but I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. Like just do a whole website where it's like blah, blah, yeah. blah, Reddit. Yeah. Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, as we're wrapping up here, I want to... I want to ask you, and you've had some conversations with um, some of your friends as well and peers, how do you position yourself as an expert to help build your brand, to help bring on more clients? I mean, I think, you know, as we're talking about having clients and, and running agencies and like having the freedom from certain uh, entities like Google or Amazon or another affiliate program, yeah, what have you done to position yourself as an expert, like overall? Because you, you've been mm -hmm. doing this for a few years to put mm -hmm. you in a position where you have like more opportunities than you know what to deal with. Yeah. Uh, okay. So everything, all of this started with me creating a lot, a lot of very detailed, very like comprehensive articles about specific things in SEO. Because like I, I already had a lot of experience when I started my blog in 2020. And I, I was always having those perfectionist tendencies and like trying to do everything in the best way, in the most comprehensible one uh, to the point of the extreme very often. But this is, I think, something that um, started uh, the ball rolling because after creating those, those articles, someone picked it up, then someone shared it on Twitter. And this is kind of how it all started. Then I was invited to a podcast. Then uh, something else happened. I was interviewed somewhere. Then I was invited, I think, to SMX Advanced. And it all started with, uh, for me, it was like the willingness to share my knowledge and to share like my entire processes, like I did with my SEO audit process, which was like a very, very long list, like 30,000 words, like the entire audit process. It was, I think, that long. So the one that was stolen, by the way. Mm. So giving to the community, I would say. And then of course, podcasts, YouTube, and finally like starting my own show, my own podcast, my, my own YouTube newsletter as well. So I think a lot of my leads also come from, from uh, videos uh, where I audit websites, or there was a video when I was auditing my own website and presenting all the SEO flaws my website has. So I think this one also landed me a client. So <laughs> I would say this honesty and sharing is, is the thing to build yourself, to position yourself Perfect. as an SEO professional. And I think the, the other area that we don't talk about often, especially any sort of uh, commerce, right? So if you're selling services, if you're selling online courses, even physical products, or if I had a coffee shop in the town that I live in, if you spend time, especially on a podcast where the connection you have with a listener is, it's, it's something different. Now, I'm a big podcast listener myself. I know you are too. And you just feel like, you know, the person, especially yeah. if they give you a few details in their show. It works as well on YouTube, and there is something about the visual component. However, on YouTube, there's a lot of distractions, and even if uh, I like a creator, I might not watch all of their video or all of their videos because there's a lot of other things I can go check out. So, so that said, the, the point is you can have a really high conversion rate because there's a, a trust there between you 
and the listener. And again, I'm a, I'm a listener myself, so I know I've you know donated to shows that I liked where I was learning about brewing beer. For years, I donated uh, whatever five bucks a month to their show, and there were thousands of other people doing it too. And that connection is not talked about too often, but it, it really will boost your conversion. So if you're thinking, hey, I want to do some freelancing, or I am a freelancer, or I have a course business, and I don't know how to boost conversions, if people can actually like get to know you, it's going to make a huge difference. Now, not everyone's going to like you, and that is okay. Um, and you'll get some negative, I get a lot of negative comments out there. Uh, do you? My, yeah, I do. I do. The um, <laughs> on my other show, especially, and then I'll 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 move on here. But on my other show, Mile High Fi, my host and I, we cuss just like on this show. We cuss occasionally, and for whatever reason, we probably like half our reviews on Apple Podcasts say uh, it could be an okay show. I don't know why they cuss. This show is not appropriate for kids. Blah blah blah. And I'm like, it says explicit on there. Like we can't set the expectations as are any more uh-huh. unless we say like we we cuss in the title like every time but anyway yeah there's a handful of negative reviews the thing is it repels some people but other people like our show because we sound more authentic at least for the audience that we're trying to attract so anyway yeah. any any thoughts on the conversion as far as having a show so I would say the same, the conversion rates are, are way better than they were, for example, just in the case of uh, me having a, a website without my, my, without my face on it or anything like that, because like all the people that came to me, come to me, they always say, I watched this. I, I, I remember you said that. So they already have a lot of references. So I am kind of this trusted person, their friend already for them. So, so to- totally a great point. Awesome. Well, we should give many, many more tips, but we're we're out of time for today. And I know you have a couple things in the works. So do you want to tell people where you can or where they could find you and upcoming projects and stuff like that? Yeah, sure. So the best place to find me is seosly.com. I'm also on Twitter, Algazar. LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, SEO Sly, Olgazar SEO, I think it is. So the current project is something I have been postponing for, for a long time because I didn't have enough time because, because I was doing this and that client work, whatnot. I'm finally, finally going to release an SEO course. Initially, this was supposed to be an SEO audit course, but it kind of, um, looking at what's happening in the industry right now all those google updates it evolved into something a little bit different Uh, so it is going to be about how to how to audit how to assess your site uh, giving all the things that are happening all the google updates eat google helpful content and uh, it will be uh, divided into two parts because like Google is saying a lot of things. Uh, I was able to like write down around 90 tangible things that Google is suggesting we do. So I will talk about all those things, how we can manifest them on, on our sites, how can we how, how we can audit our sites for them. But there is also the other side uh, of the coin, I would say, where uh, is Google uh, really that smart? Um, does uh, Google know how to read a page? Uh, maybe uh, there are other ways in which we can satisfy the algorithm. So in this second part, I will be a little bit critical of what Google is saying. And if you have done everything correctly, as Google is saying, and you are still not getting results, then there may be this other side you can also explore. I'm not saying like black hat techniques like spamming, but something that, that is probably not necessarily what Google is suggesting, suggesting, but something that works. So there will be like this gray and white hat kind of portion of that course. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I'll link up so people can get to all your stuff and I'll, I'll do the same. You could find me over on niche site project. You could find me on YouTube as well. You could just search for me and we'll link up to it. Of course. Now one announcement, one new thing I'm doing, I'm launching a new podcast 
which seems crazy because I already have two. I don't even have it named yet, but <laughs> the idea, it, it'll be SEO and marketing. So somewhat similar to what I talk about on the Doug show. However, it will be for industry professionals. So these are going to be higher level topics. They're going to be more detailed, really in the weeds. And again, it's for professionals in the industry versus on the Doug show, it's more kind of mainstream general uh, topics and sometimes success stories. And on the new show, the unnamed show, it's going to be folks that speak at conferences, like that sort of thing. Stories from the field, of course, but really uh, sort of actionable items and a different set of formats for the show as well. So I'm excited about that. And you should sign up for the email list or at least check out this show to get more details about it. So cool. Awesome. I All hope right. to be I hope to be a guest on your show. <laughs> yes, we I need to talk to you about it. And okay. Th those there's some details, but yeah, yeah, we'll definitely hook that up. Awesome. So, all right. Well, thanks for being on the show and thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug.